today's webinar will discuss the satellite industry's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm pleased to introduce the panelists. David Meltzer, Secretary General of the GVF. Martin Gerald, International Programme Development, GVF. And Ralph Brooker, owner of Satprof. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Morning. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Now, let me start with you, David. We're in the middle of a crisis. We're in the middle of this pandemic. How has it impacted the satellite industry's business? How badly has it been affected and how quickly will it recover? Well, the, in, the industry is certainly not unique. It's been impacted. Um, to the extent of how much of an impact, I think uh, to paraphrase the CEO of SES, one of our larger uh, industry members, it's too early to tell. Certainly some sectors uh, have been very significantly impacted. I'm thinking of uh, aeronautical in-flight connectivity, uh, the cruise line industry, and to a lesser extent, um, sporting events, special events, uh, what in the industry we call occasional use TV. Um, certainly those sectors have been impacted for the worse, uh, but it's not entirely bleak. If you look at other sectors such as um, cellular backhaul, uh, such as um, the provision of broadband directly to people's homes, in those cases operators have seen significant increases in business. I think in uh, in some operators' cases, uh, you're seeing um, tens of thousands of new subscribers uh, for direct uh, broadband connectivity to the home, uh, and that's clearly a function of the increased work from home requirements. Uh, you're also seeing in cellular backhaul in certain segments anywhere from 10 to 50 percent. Uh, certain rural areas, islands, uh, as the cellular networks have gotten congested, again, through um, increased work from home. Uh, you're seeing increased traffic being carried by the satellite operators. So um, we'll obviously go down a little more detail, but I think the overall picture, and if you look at the, uh, the results from the public companies that have reported on their first quarter of the calendar year, um, which obviously the month of March is impacted, uh, they're all seeing um, flat to even positive growth. Now that will change, particularly for some sectors, but I, I do think overall, um, it's not bleak. Um, there are sectors, certainly verticals, that have been more impacted than others. Um, but uh, there are other sectors where it's been, in fact, growth. If we actually fine tune this a bit and look at the, the, the verticals within the satellite industry, Ralph and Martin, you know, which have been hit the hardest? How has the business landscape changed through this pandemic? If I could ask you that, Ralph, and then we'll move on to Martin. Well, um, as, as the training uh, manager for GVF, we have you know, thousands and thousands of students. So we get a very interesting perspective on, on an, an aspect of the industry. Um, what we've seen is really kind of three kinds of responses to this that it ranges from uh, collapse or, or uh, contraction uh, in certain businesses to kind of a holding pattern, those industries or those companies that have the resources to do so will uh, keep people on but have them occupy themselves with things like training while they're working at home if they can't be in the field. And then in some cases, there's actually growth, as, as David said. The, there's, there are um, clearly in the maritime, short term um, and energy areas, there are a number of firms that are having really severe trouble and are, are contracting and we see that. Uh, aeronautical obviously is, is struggling at the moment, at least uh, for now. Um, but other areas like um, military use, um, where they're not just laying off people, obviously, they're, they're making good use of that time uh, to prepare for the future and are uh, uh, having people, as we see them, um, prepare themselves for growth later with, with training. Uh, similarly, with wireless backhaul, um, there's growth there too. We see a number of providers who are ramping up on their training needs, which is, I think, a, an indicator that they're, they're beginning to grow or they're responding to demand for growth because of the crisis. Martin, what's your take on this? Yeah, obviously, um, reflecting on what Ralph has said and re reinforcing uh, um, his observations, um, 
aeronautical, maritime, oil and gas, all significantly impacted. When you consider aeronautical, the amount of traffic, it's down to about 2% or something ridiculously low figure like that compared to normal times. Um, maritime cruise traffic just isn't there. Maritime cargo is still there, moving materials and goods, of course. And there on the, <clears throat> in, in a way it's an upside, but an upside coming out of the unfortunate and uh, circumstances that we have at the moment that the, um, the platform satellite has been able to respond very, very positively to help out an even more extreme crew welfare consideration in the uh, maritime cargo environment. Crews are changing less frequently. They're more isolated than ever before. And specific entities, specific organizations and companies within the industry have responded to actually enable, sometimes at nil additional cost or nil cost uh, uh, entirely, to enable crews to keep in contact with home, loved ones, etc., And of course, to be able to access um, the kinds of um, broadband based uh, entertainment streaming that the rest of us have all been uh, um, leveraging off as well. Um, we're looking at now with some governments in the world where those parts of the world where the impact of the coronavirus is perceived by some as somewhat diminishing uh, governments looking to reducing the uh, level of lockdown and i think that in those areas we're going to be seeing in the medium term um something something of an uptick people are going to start traveling again people are going to want to maintain the levels of broadband based connectivity that they've grown increasingly used to during the time of lockdown and to carry that over. For example, imagine a particular individual finally being able to go on holiday, go on vacation on a cruise ship. They're going to be wanting to tell the whole world or at least their family and friends about um, what they're doing. It, it'll be like a, a reversal of cabin fever, if you like, if, you, if you'll forgive the pun, because I'm talking about uh, cruise ships. So I think um, there's going to be a significant uptick there. But it's not all positive um, in as much as if we look at particular elements within the uh, within the satellite industry, that our industry is affected just like all other industries by what the economic effect is going to be of the pandemic. What kind of uh, next phase, next step is going to actually, is actually occur? Is it going to be a simple economic bounce back, or is it going to be what some people have described as a as a double dip? And, and the meaning of the double dip essentially being that there will be across all sorts of industries, including our own, um, major structural changes occurring within the industry. And the extent of the major structural change will affect different parts of the satellite industry um, differently. And I think the ones that are going to be sort of most severely impacted, and this comes back to the theme that was established earlier on regarding um, satellite and the, the, the world of mobile, um, that could well be impacted if the economic, uh, the new economic uh, considerations, the new economic circumstance is that of a double dip requiring major structural change. So mobility will be affected, but also um, I think um, there is a possibility of an impact on the uh, NGSO manufacturing environment as well. Okay, well, yeah, taking you up on, you know, there are struggles. We've had three high profile chapter 11s in the last few weeks, Intelsat, OneWeb and Speedcast. Um, to what extent have those been triggered by the pandemic or is this crisis masking an already fragile industry? Um, mm. If you could answer that, Ralph, please. Sure, um, and th those are firms that directly impacted us. <laughs> We're kind of close to that. Um, Intelsat, uh, I mean, clearly the, their Chapter 11 was tightly involved with the C-band issue in the U.S. Uh, and the SEC's uh, reallocation and the aftermath of rearranging for that. Um, more than likely, the COVID crisis contributed to that, but uh, in a little bit more indirect way. OneWeb um, was burning through uh, cash at a pretty high rate and they're building out a very large system. Uh, 
with a lot of ground infrastructure, and they were dependent upon a, a repeating a, a series of financial slugs to come from uh, primarily SoftBank and, and others, uh, right at the point where they needed a large infusion of next round funding, uh, the COVID crisis hit and SoftBank uh, retracted and they had no alternative. Um, now, whether it was entirely due to, to, to COVID or this was an accumulation of other factors as well, um, but surely this, the, that was a straw that, that broke the camel's back. Uh, and I know it was a surprise and it happened very fast at, at the end. Uh, so clearly that the, the, the pandemic had significant um, effect there. Um, Speedcast, <laughs> um, I mean, they'd grown uh, by, by acquisition and were in the process of integrating a large company out of a collection of medium and small companies. Uh, so they were struggling with integration issues and, and cost management as they worked through that. Uh, at the time the crisis hit, there, there are two major uh, customer bases, um, namely cruise ship services and energy services, both suddenly dropped. And that combination, which you could definitely say was triggered by the crisis, um, just put them over the edge and they couldn't proceed. Now, interesting enough, while we're talking about this, we've had a question come in from mm -hmm. Alexander. Um, he'd like you to comment a little on the general state of the supply chains for SATCOM manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a huge spike in demand, but can't really ramp up production lines as needed, all impacted by COVID. Uh, can you comment on that? So let, let me uh, take the, the first uh, stab at that. Um, certainly, there has been an impact on supply chain. Uh, we've seen uh, Ariane Spas, which launches out of French Guiana. Um, they've suspended launches because of the pandemic. Um, and that has impacted at least one operator has said that there will be a delay in launching one of their satellites. Um, I know other, other portions of the supply chain, of course, have been impacted. Um, some of our um, industry members have actually taken steps to mitigate the impact. I'm thinking, for example, Lockheed Martin, a very large company, very active in the space sector. Um, they are accelerating payments to their suppliers, uh, I think close to $200 million, to keep those um, suppliers in business uh, and continuing to produce the components and services that Lockheed Martin depends upon for their end customers. Um, other operators, I know uh, Maxar has also seen an impact um, in its operations as it produces uh, or manufactures satellites. So I would say it's, it's a mixed pic uh, picture. Certainly there are impacts. Members of the industry are doing things to mitigate the impact, um, but there will be a medium term at the very least impact on certain operations such as manufacturing and launch uh, and various components on the ground segment probably are being impacted as well. There is, David, there, sorry, go on, Martin. There is just one additional thing that I'd like to add into that. It's a very, very specific example, and it applies to one specific US company, um, which, I, which I won't mention, but um, in terms of their positioning within the supply chain, and, and the context of this is the United States context. Um, and it's... These are not necessarily large companies to which this applies, but there's um, something, the, the United States defense industrial base, wherein companies are um, required and um, given additional assistance from, from government, um, because what they actually do in terms of the supply chain is so essential that um, operations and manufacturer or, uh, and the service delivery cannot actually be stopped more or less under any circumstances. So provision will be made to ensure that that kind of uh, continuity in the supply chain does continue. Okay. Um, before I move on, we've just had a, another question come in from Jean Cunningham. Uh, Ralph, you spoke about the reallocation by the FCC of C-band in the US and how Intelsat was affected. Her question is, did that reallocation affect Central and South America as well? Uh, I, not 
directly to my knowledge, and I'm certainly not an expert. David may be able to speak better than I can on that. But uh, the FCC ruling specifically covers the way that uh, and primarily impacts downlinks that provide um, uh, primarily video services within the U.S. video distribution services and shifting of uh, and paying for um, uh, local receiving stations like cable head ends to shut off their C-band receive services and switch over to fiber instead. Um, so how I'm sure there are, there are equivalent issues happening as C-band is retracted step by step in various ways around the world. But yeah. uh, perhaps David can speak to that. Yeah, happy to and thanks Ralph. Um, yes, as Ralph said, the, the FCC order was limited to the United States. Other governments, administrations uh, in the Americas region are examining whether or not to follow um, the lead, if you will, of the Federal Communications Commission here in the US. Um, I think th the position of the industry is very clear that the US market is very much unique. Um, if you look at other markets where C-band is um, heavily utilized, not necessarily as much for broadcast as it is in the US, um, but for other, other services, um, the U.S. model really does not work in terms of reallocating uh, spectrum uh, from C-band, from the satellites, over to the, um, uh, the mobile uh, industry. So it's definitely going to be a country-by-country -country, uh, examination. Uh, some countries may follow suit, but I think the majority of the countries will realize that the U.S. situation uh, is very much unique and it does not apply uh, to their country. Now, before we move on to uh, the discussion, we've got two more questions which I'd quite like to take because they relate to this topic. The first one is from Andre Kirilovich. Now, he's asking, is there any delays or impact on the supply chain for ground segments? VSAT vendors, RF manufacturers impact both on production and logistics as borders are sometimes closed. Martin? There is obviously some <clears throat> evidence to that effect, yes. And with the situation with the pandemic, and we've touched on this before in terms of the extent to which the pandemic is exacerbating certain pre-existing issues. Now, with, um, with VSATs, with the VSAT terminals, um, we are an industry that has been working for many, many years to actually make customs barriers go away, to make um, licensing restrictions go away, to make all sorts of obstacles to the meeting of the level of demand that is actually uh, actually exists um so with those uh issues still being extant naturally the pandemic is actually making them more difficult if you have a government administration that is if, is like everybody else affected by uh the pandemic crisis with lockdowns etc cetera, etc cetera, decisions on importation etc cetera, etc cetera, are going to be delayed new licensing decisions are going to be delayed um, we have, when it comes to logistics, uh, we have the maritime industry still working to actually move stuff around the world. But again, there are difficulties, in additional difficulties in terms of the transportation of, the, of, of physical equipment. So yes, one can't actually de uh, can't deny that there are significant specific issues with uh, delivering, if you'll forgive the pun, on um, actual equipment. But um, it's not something unique to this pandemic situation. That's essentially the point. It is, it highlights some of these difficulties and coming out of the pandemic, then we need to actually look at how we can actually address these issues, specifically putting reinforced arguments in front of, let's say government and regulatory decision makers in terms of easing the uh, import of uh, the necessary visa equipment into, um, into their territories. So the extent to, and I know I'm maybe looking too much on the upside, but there is something definitely positive coming out of this because it's going to make decision makers realize just how critical their decisions are and how it actually prevents them from carrying out many of their own mission critical functions in uh, an environment like the pandemic 
if only they'd had the solutions more easily accessible for people to use. They need to change their perspective on the kinds of rules that are applied generally, but even more so in specific circumstances like COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take two more questions from our audience before we move on. Uh, this one is from Miro. He's talking about the international flight restrictions across the world. And he's wondering how the satellite industry is leveraging on local content to address demand in African countries. Now, I don't know which, would you want to take that, Martin, or David, or Ralph, which? Well, I could, I could say, um, uh, yeah, as far as local content or hardware goes, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I was going to say a moment ago that from our perspective, we do see that manufacturers of ground equipment are still continuing. They're, they're modifying their their production environment to reduce uh, exposure to mutual exposure to, to workers in factories. So that slowed them down. Uh, but one of the main issues they're facing is they can't uh, have people go to places where equipment needs to be installed. So there's a uh, increased um, interest in uh, training people who are already in the place that the equipment is going to, whether that be a, a customer, uh, customer's own staff or uh, NGOs uh, at a location uh, to find a way to allow them to uh, configure and install equipment that is shipped in because shipping does through air freight and maritime does seem to be to be functioning. Getting get, getting local content that is particularly applicable to localities and to regions has always been an issue and of course not one that is peculiar to satellite as a service and transport platform but to the telecommunications industry uh, more broadly more generally um, and again I think the example of this pandemic is and it will provide an additional emphasis um, and give additional traction to the arguments that this kind of information needs, local information needs to be locally available. But it's something for the uh, the industry in its interactions with the other stakeholders needs to address and the stimulus for addressing it more firmly really ought to come from this, the example of this pandemic. And if I may, just to uh, conclude on the, the question, um, Broadcast services obviously are something that satellite is particularly strong in delivering and that that includes local content uh, and you see in Africa in particular um, satellites being utilized for broadcast and to broadcast local content and it can be health related in terms of educating the, the citizens how to prevent or how to um, respond to uh, the symptoms of COVID-19. And you also see in Africa, in particular, uh, broadcast services are, use the word, stickier uh, than perhaps in other regions of the world where you have over the top or um, you know, broadband delivered by uh, cable, for example, services. So in Africa in particular, uh, local content being broadcast by satellite is very much a, a, an area of the business that is being positively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, as it's increasingly shown as being important to governments and their citizens. Well, the questions are coming in thick and fast, and uh, I'm just going to ask one more before we move on. And that is, it's with regards to the cost of ground segment. Is the COVID situation impacted the cost? And is this just short term or medium term? I don't know whether you want to take that, David. It, it, it's all speculation on, on my part. Um, and as Martin said, the, the pandemic is impacting um, various manufacturers, whether it be satellites or a ground segment. And wherever you see uh, shortages, you often see prices increase. But I've seen, and I've, I've talked to many in the industry, I've reviewed a lot of materials being produced by the industry. I've not seen anything specific to shortages in ground segment, but again, it would not surprise me. Um, the other issue is even if there is uh, supply, uh, the pandemic certainly is impacting importation. Uh, as many countries have said, when the products are imported into their country, they must be quarantined for 10 or 14 days. And so 
speed of delivery of uh, ground segment uh, is certainly going to be impacted in some countries. And we've seen that uh, in one case that I'm familiar with, uh, in fact, following a uh, cyclone that struck in the South Pacific, in, in particular Vanuatu and uh, Samoa, where um, equipment necessarily had to be um, maintained in customs, uh, communications equipment. Now, in that case, fortunately, um, there was uh, already satellite terminals, and I'm thinking of the uh, satellite operator Pacific. They had terminals already in those countries, Vanuatu in particular, and telecommunications were able to be quickly restored, relying on those uh, small terminals that were already in country, while replacement um, telecommunications equipment necessarily had to be quarantined at customs. Well, I'm going to stick with you, David, as we move on. Um, what business lessons, if any, has the satellite industry learned from the crisis we find ourselves in? I think the industry, like, like frankly all industries, has learned that diversification of your services um, is very important and helpful in, if not immunizing, to borrow a phrase, but at least mitigating uh, the impacts of uh, a pandemic. So for those companies within the industry that um, have a strong cellular backhaul, a strong broadcast, a strong uh, direct-to-consumer broadband, um, they will be protected to a large degree from the impacts that they may see in other lines of service, such as in-flight connectivity, such as cruise lines, such as occasionally used TV. Um, just, just for a minute to focus on um, in-flight connectivity, Aero, and I know we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, there was a, a, a study released, I think, within the last week by Northern Sky Research, and the headlines there is that they, and again, this is a forecast by a consultant, they forecast a, I think it was a 38% decline in revenue 2019 to 2020, uh, as a result of the pandemic. But what's really interesting is they similarly predict a 18 to 24 month period to rebound. And as they look forward to the 10 year period of 2019 to 2020, they're seeing a annual growth rate, a cumulative annual growth rate of very close to 10%. So I think the headline, at least according to this one study for in-flight connectivity, and it may be very similar for cruise line, is that yes, a significant uh, impact in the short term, but recovery, at least uh, in Northern Sky Research's view, in 18 to 24 months and back to very robust growth that this sector or this vertical had been enjoying prior to the, um, uh, the pandemic. Well, a quick question here. Um, with the rise of the new space sector, specifically satcoms, are we going to see some of the legacy or prime sat players repurposing or pivoting into the new space sector post COVID? Martin? I think the short answer to that is a yes. In as much as um, one of the potential drivers that may force, if you like, a restructuring of the industry in the event that the economic outcome is the so-called double dip as opposed to a simple bounce back is that it's those some of those areas of activity that fall under the new space umbrella whilst a number of the organizations currently engaged in it may not actually survive financially through this crisis the areas of activity in which they've engaged are recognized as being clearly of great significance. This also interrelates with um, what I like to think of and others have said is a pre-existing emergence of the, a blurring of the line between SATCOMs and other space applications, particularly Earth observation. There have been lots of examples that have come out in the course of uh, the pandemic over the last several months of earth observation based applications having direct importance 
in terms of alleviating and addressing certain facets of the lockdown period, of the social distancing period. For example, applications that are live monitoring the movements of people. And those applications then feed into uh, their own personal devices to advise them, hey, look, here's a picture of the area you're moving towards. It could be for shopping. It could be for one of these dry drive through uh, COVID testing centers with an associated recommendation to avoid and go to an, another location. So it's live, real time downloads of information using Earth observation satellites. <clears throat> But of course, not Earth observation satellites, the, the legacy versions of it, the new space areas of it, where we actually have um, dedicated specific applications and satellites are devoted to looking at particular areas to address predefined applications. And there is a flexibility within these new space EO systems to actually kind of address those kinds of things, i.e. going beyond, going beyond weather, going beyond just land use. Actually, applications that are devoted dynamically to people's movements um, uh, uh, around their locale. So that's just one example of the extent to which a new space type of activity is really going to be drawn in to what may be described as legacy space. Okay. Well, I'm going to move us slightly away from the, the, the business model now, and we're going to look a little bit more at what satellite can actually do. And the question is, uh, Martin, we're in a humanitarian crisis, restricted travel movements. Mm. This is affecting the ability of some relief organizations to go about their work. In what particular ways has the industry responded to the pandemic? Yeah. <clears throat> well, strategically, um, a satellite has always been heavily orientated, of course, towards the humanitarian assistance and disaster response environment. We have the example, for example, of the United Nations Connectivity Charter, uh, in which a GVF was a, a, a prime actor in developing. Um, GVF additionally represents the industry in the World Food, Food Programme administered emergency telecommunications cluster. Um, so that's by way of background. Um, other considerations, and this is important, is that Let's not forget that during this pandemic, there is an awful lot of other stuff going on, whether it's current disaster, potential disaster, or at least ensuring that, for example, uh, minimization of the impact of mass immunization programs going on around the world with reference to rubella, with reference to um, the measles, for example. Uh, and satellite ha has a role in all of this. Um, but one specific example, I suppose, that is, and I think David has already alluded to this, um, across Asia Pacific, um, a new uh, satellite operator company, and it has made available to island chains right the way across the Pacific Ocean, both uh, physical resources, uh, terminals, and also access to um, uh, space segments at, at reduced costs. So the instance of this pandemic is just the latest example of a long train of examples in which satellite is the platform of necessity, not just of choice, but of necessity to actually address HADR uh, concerns. Um, but this also relates in, in terms of human capacity building as well, the kind of human capacity building that uh, Ralph has already alluded to and that GVF provides through uh, GVF training. David, uh, what particular services is the satellite sector providing? Um, and it, is there anything unique about them? So satellite provides a, a broad range of services and we've talked about a few that have been uh, highlighted as critically important during the pandemic. Um, you know, direct to consumer broadband uh, with people working from home increasingly, many of those homes uh, don't have the connectivity they would otherwise enjoy in their, their business location. 
and satellite is there, it is stepping up. And as I think I mentioned, um, uh, Hughes has seen, I think it was over or very close to 40,000 uh, new subscribers just in the first quarter in the Americas region for their broadband uh, to consumer uh, services. Um, you also see the uh, cellular backhaul as very important um, and growing uh, because of the pandemic and the increased work from home and the increased traffic that is congesting certain cellular uh, networks. And so they look to the satellite systems to carry their traffic, particularly from remote areas, uh, rural areas, islands. Um, all this goes to what are the unique advantages of satellite delivered communications. The satellites are in space. Um, they are, and to Martin's uh, immediately, uh, immediate comment, the satellites are not impacted by natural disasters occurring on Earth. Um, they are ultra, ultra reliable at 99.9999 plus percent of the time. Uh, the, uh, the infrastructure that's on the ground is similarly very reliable, uh, proven. I mean, antennas have been manufactured for decades now. So very reliable, in some cases, uh, low cost, easily to, re to replace, easily to uh, transport. Uh, so the ubiquity of satellite communications, the reliability of satellite communications, the quality of satellite communications, all of these inherent factors are, are uh, demonstrating that satellite during the pandemic is an element of the critical infrastructure needed to respond to and mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. But fine tuning this a bit, and if Martin, if you could come in on this one, has there been anything that the industry has done that is specific for the needs of patients, medical professionals, and other essential frontline personnel? Mm, yeah, well, Broadly speaking, the industry's response um, to um, the pandemic fell under four, four, four basic uh, uh, categories, if you like. Um, there was employee safety and security, uh, strategic business stability, uh, customer service continuity, and supply chain maintenance. Now, we've already touched on one or, one or two of those, but I'm bringing in a, a slightly different angle to, to one of those in terms of a uh, customer service continuity. And by that, I mean the nature of the clientele for the industry has actually changed as a result of the pandemic because industry has actually successfully uh, reorientated its resources to deal with key specific on the ground issues. Um, so let's take the example of a manufacturing company using 3D printers as part of their manufacturing processes using those 3D printers to actually produce PPE equipment. Um, the SatMed platform, for example, based out of Luxembourg, has been enhanced to deliver um, essential uh, diagnostic and treatment tools to inform um, medics in parts of the world that perhaps are working within the context of rather more fragile health service situations. Um, there's a, one company in the industry that has actually gone so far as to suggest and indeed sets out in some considerable detail in a white paper that costs the whole argument, um, provisioning for a global telemedicine vehicle network. And that's something, that's a, a specific example of something that I think would uh, very usefully be addressed from the point of view of this pandemic, of course, not only affecting uh, the developed world, the richer economies, those that have been um, the more earlier, uh, earlier infected, but um, also now affecting increasingly, there's in, in the news examples of the effects in the, in the developing world. Um, it's not looking too bad across the African content, uh, continent at the moment, but who knows, unfortunately, if that's going to get much, 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 much worse. Um, so I think that given the industry's background with a reference to dealing with humanitarian assistance and disaster response, the best positioned of any part of the telecommunications sector 
to actually um, not only deal with things strategically, but actually bring to tactically bring specific solutions to specific situations because partly, as David alluded to, the ubiquity and also because the industry can be very, very flexible indeed. Well, David, let me bring you in here. Um, what about support from the government? What is needed by the industry to continue its response to the pandemic? Well, the pandemic has certainly highlighted uh, what I think we all refer to as the digital divide. And the fact that uh, the pandemic does not respect borders, um, that rural areas, relatively unconnected, um, underserved areas, are, have special vulnerabilities uh, to uh, the pandemic and its effects. Um, many governments are recognizing the, the, the cost now of having a digital divide. So a lot of governments are looking at increasing support for bridging that divide to bring telecommunication services, uh, hopefully broadband, but even in, in some cases, uh, 3G, 4G, uh, to parts of the world that are impacted by the pandemic um, but are not properly served. Uh, so what governments can do, I think, for are, are two things, and this is true for the communication sector, is provide support that um, helps build out the communications infrastructure, serving those who at present are underserved or not served at all. Um, the, other, the other element or area where the governments can really step up and help would actually cost governments nothing. As I've talked about it, satellite is uniquely positioned to provide telecommunication services to those on the other side of the digital divide because the satellites are there because the ubiquity, the reliability and the cost as well, uh, satellites are especially uh, well positioned to provide services to the uh, underserved communities. All of those services depend upon uh, electromagnetic spectrum, radio communication spectrum. And um, it's important for governments to ensure that the satellite industry has the spectrum needed to provide the communication services. Um, to put it another way, um, like oxygen is to fire, spectrum is to satellite communication services. Without spectrum, the services cannot be provided. Um, without additional spectrum, additional services cannot be provided. So uh, two ways governments can help uh, one is to, and this is true for all telecommunications providers, provide support as we increasingly narrow the digital divide. And second is for governments to ensure that the industry, the satellite industry, has the spectrum it needs to provide these critical services to underserved communities. Um, well, we've just got a question coming here, and it's with regards about governments all over the world mitigating the effect and impact of COVID-19 in different ways on the business communities and governance. What is the GVF? The question is, what is the GVF doing to encourage cost reduction and expansion of satellite transmission? So something GVF has, has done and a number of the other satellite trade associations as well is we've created advocacy pieces to um, promote the awareness of the role of satellite communications in mitigating the impact of the, uh, the COVID-19 impact. Uh, frankly, advocating, getting the word out that satellite is certainly part of the critical infrastructure needed to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And uh, these efforts are continuing not just uh, by postings on websites, which is very good, and use of social media, which is also good, but in direct communications with regulators and governments around the world. As governments consider, for example, um, reallocating spectrum, we spoke about earlier in the US, the C-band uh, spectrum, and other administrations at least taking a look at it, uh, what GVF can and has been doing is informing, educating, and advocating on behalf of the industry as to the critical role the industry plays, not just in responding to the pandemic, but in providing basic communication services as well as advanced communication services to all communities. Uh, thank you, David. I'd, I'd like to bring in Ralph now. Um, Ralph, with most of the world still in lockdown, the new norm is to work from home. 
Uh, this is causing changes in network traffic distribution, especially in underserved localities. Um, what role can satellite play in delivering better services to this new demographic? Well, one thing that satellite communications is extremely good at is rapidly deploying services, and in particular for communities that have uh, insufficient uh, mobile wireless or 3G, 4G services. Uh, if they uh, don't have sufficient backhaul capacity uh, from, from those cellular sites or from Wi-Fi hubs, you can deploy fairly large amounts of bandwidth very, very quickly with satellite terminals. Um, so that's, that's an area I think we're seeing that happen already uh, very recently with, with rapid growth of, of backhaul services. So that's the, the primary way I think that we can help. Well, SATPROF delivers online satellite training programs for installers, engineers, etc. Um, have you made any changes to the GVF online training program to support the industry, specifically to cope with the pandemic? We have, and I think as hopefully everybody knows, we, we have an extensive uh, online uh, simulation interactive based uh, training program that we offer uh, what we think is really low cost. Um, so that's continuing, but what we've added um, to, to support the industry at this time is deferred payments. So if you are uh, impacted by the crisis, you can uh, defer your tuition cost, which is already pretty low anyway, but you can defer that by, by three months uh, to allow you uh, as an individual or as a company managing staff to, to take advantage of the time that might be downtime to get people trained uh, without having to worry about um, cost of that training until we hope that uh, things recover in a few months and we'll be, be back on track. Um, also, uh, just to add, not, we didn't do this specifically for the, the um, COVID uh, crisis, but we've added a couple of certification paths which make it possible to get uh, a type of GVF uh, field technician and field engineer certification uh, without traveling to a hands-on skills test. Uh, these, these don't replace our existing certifications where you, you normally do a, an on-site final test to get certified, uh, but it's, an all, it's kind of a supplement alternative path. Uh, and we are confident that the, the technical simulators that we have in the online training are tough enough that uh, if you can complete this series of courses and the exam, including skills assessment with simulators that that val that's uh, you, you earn a it's you earn a certification from GVF for doing that uh, we we happened to roll those out right before the COVID crisis came and I think they're proving to be pretty useful now that people have uh, a lot of trouble traveling uh, to places where they would normally have gone to do a, a skills test which they can still do later as a follow-up but this gets them gets them started and they can actually get a, a the, you know, well-respected GVS certification from home in, in, a, in field engineering, field technician areas. Um, let me bring you in, David. Do you think the pandemic will change the industry's views on how to conduct business in the future? Will the new norm be online meetings rather than face-to-face? -face? I don't think it will necessarily be the norm. I, I do think... Um, the increased work from home, uh, the increased use of um, uh, video platforms such as the one we're using today um, has indicated or has demonstrated that um, more um, digital meetings can occur. And I suspect um, long-term trend is we will see more digital meetings such as this one. Um, will it replace um, face-to-face uh, meetings, whether it be conferences or just uh, a small meeting um, Absolutely not. Um, but I do see having a long-term influence on how business is conducted, but certainly not replacing face-to-face -face meetings uh, and even conferences, I think, will come back. It just will be perhaps on a smaller scale. And I think, uh, that, extend, I think that extends to, uh, to cover the issue of exhibitions as well. There may be fewer of them. They may be smaller in scale companies may send smaller contingents um, but these these events will continue to occur because I think when it actually comes to 
uh, preparation for putting a signature on a dotted line to make make a major, major purchase, then both uh, seller and buyer still place will place a, a great deal of importance on the on the face to face, on the importance of a handshake, and indeed on the importance of sometimes actually physically seeing that in the case of equipment that which is actually being purchased. Right, I, I've got two questions come in. I'm going to uh, direct them both at uh, you, Ralph. Uh, the first question is from Alexander, and he's saying that here in Brazil, for example, companies are struggling to find qualified engineers within the field. Um, and this is slowing down company expansion. What are the solutions? And we have the second question from Miro, which is, how will the GVF address providing examiners remotely for students who need to go through the examination to apply for GVF certifications. Okay, well, uh, on Alexander's first question, we're obviously uh, continuing to provide the online certification training program and we're gradually adding more and more courses to that. Uh, so uh, provided that students can get access some basic level of internet connection, they can they can get trained that, for that. And we have uh, scholarship programs for uh, a number of developing countries uh, as well and, and various kinds of discounts to help with the cost there. Um, as far as the uh, examiners, the, the context here is that to, to get a traditional GVF, and we call SATCOM professional certification, uh, which is intended for uh, people in the field, they take online courses and then they complete a hands-on skills test according to a, a checklist of, of um, verified skills that they demonstrate with real hardware and someone that we call an examiner who's qualified to assess their skills. Um, but there's, we really haven't found a way to, to do that um, online. Um, but what we've done instead, as I mentioned a moment ago, is to create a couple of alternative parallel certifications that uh, make heavier use of the simulators online. Um, and we've found, and certainly my own experience in giving these, as an examiner, giving these skills, that when people come to, to verify that they can you know, correctly set up and install and accurately point an antenna without making interference, that they're saying, well, this is really just exactly what I did on the online training. I already know how to do this. I'm just doing it with a wrench in my hand instead of my, a mouse with my hand. Uh, so we're pretty confident that the simulators are a pretty close representation of the skills we do in the hands-on skills test anyway. Uh, so that's what I would recommend is for people to have a look at our, our new certifications called Field Tech and Field Engineer, uh, which enable you to get a certification uh, without having to travel to, to meet an examiner. Well, I think we've had a question come in, Ralph, from either mm -hmm. one of your potential students or an existing student. Okay who's asking if he's not able to complete his course at the stipulated time as a result of the pandemic, what assistance are you offering? <laughs> well, uh, we have the deferred payments. If, um, if we, we offer most courses through a subscription model, which is simply time-based. So you can, you can do as many or as few as you want within that one year period. Uh, so if you're renewing your certification, we can certainly accept um, deferred payment for, for next year's subscription uh, to help you keep going until things are a bit better. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to bring in Martin now. Uh, Martin, has the pandemic elevated the general realization that satellite is much more than a niche platform, mm. but is integral to today's communications mm. network? Right, well, if I'm absolutely honest, I've always had a little bit of a problem with satellite being described as niche. I'm not speaking to myself here, uh, for myself here rather, but um, if you were to ask a soccer fan pretty much anywhere in the world, he or she would probably say, well, I consider satellite to be pretty important in terms of delivering the content that I'm after. Um, but anyway, that... Uh, um, light-hearted comment aside, I think the the extent to which um, some people say and have described a satellite as niche, then yes, absolutely, that is eroding. That is that is going away. 
um, the beginnings of this were pre pre COVID nineteen, I think, and um, but the, the nature of the pandemic has simply served to compound and magnify the uh, the, the recognition, the general realization that it is much more than a niche platform. It also partly interrelates with the importance that what might be grouped simply as satcoms in terms of the dissemina uh, dissemination of geospatial information coming from Earth observation, given that the, 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 the former divide between those two areas of technology is, is blurring and they're, they're, they're increasingly coming together. Um, it also precedes uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the rollout and the move towards 5G uh, in as much as the satellite industry has long been saying um, our cousins in the uh, terrestrial cellular industry are increasingly recognizing that in terms of being able to realize the fully fledged potential of 5G, satellite is absolutely integral to the solution. It's integral to the solution of being able to deliver networks of networks. That is probably one of the simpler ways of understanding the concept of 5G, being that it is such a different animal to the previous Gs, different to four, different to three, and so on. Um, there's one not exactly lighthearted point that I'd like to make here, but one that, because it's actually quite a disturbing phenomenon, but the extent to which satellite has become, perhaps become even more um, high profile in the general consciousness of the general population. And that's the dissemination through social media of this nonsense that um, 5G deployment is actually responsible for COVID-19. Um, and some, some people have been saying, oh, it's not 5G, it's satellite 5G, and it's satellite that's to blame. Of course, it's fake news, it's nonsense, it's rubbish, it's been completely um, denied, of course, right the way across those that actually know what they're talking about, as opposed to those social media elements. But it's recognised that satellite, if you forgive the pun, is actually up there. It's become more up there in people's, in, in people's profile adding to the significance that it has for uh, international soccer fans. Well, I like the soccer fans uh, analogy. Um, I'm well aware that we are coming to the end of the webinar, and I'd just like to sum this up with a final question for all three panellists. And that is, and I must read this from a piece of paper, um, John Finney, CEO, Isotropic Systems, quoted last week as saying, with its reach, immediacy, nimbleness and flexibility. Satellite will enable us all to be far better prepared for whatever comes our way in the post-COVID-19 world, whether we're a school, a hospital, a government or business. Now my question to all three panellists is, how true is this statement or is it just wishful thinking? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, it's 100% true. Satellite always there always on, sees the whole world, the entire world's population. So um, absolutely agree with John. I, I agree too. I, and I, what comes to mind is the example of where I live, which is only a few kilometers from Washington, DC. We cannot get a fiber uh, speed internet to our residences because the cost of implementing it is so high that even in a relatively dense urban area, uh, that the financial barrier is not worth uh, the uh, potential revenue it'll take. Satellite can completely break that. I mean, you, could, you could, if if we can get to, and we're gradually getting there, having internet bandwidth, um, broadband access available at costs that are similar to or better than uh, terrestrial alternatives, there's enormous uh, good that we can do, not just for rural communities, but uh, but even urban communities all over the world. I know John, he's spoken at a number of events at which I've chaired. And so I'm not just being nice, but he's absolutely right. Well, that, was, that, was, that was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Thank you very much. I'd just like to sum up a few things today for all of those people who have tuned in. I'd like to thank the panellists first for giving their views on quite a varied uh, number of topics. Um, there's some interesting things that came out of there. Satellite clearly provides a massive service that a lot of people really don't know about. And for last mile connection, there's nothing to compete with it. Um, yes, there are issues with the industry, but I think overall, once we come out of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we will have a realigned industry, which hopefully will be fit for future purpose. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. Uh, Ralph, I'd just like to point out there's lots of questions coming in about your online training program. Yes, and hopefully we will get around to those soon. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and I hope you've enjoyed it.